Hi, Misha here. And in the past, actually long ago, I talked about some of the Clone Wars era walkers, including this AT RT. This is from the old Titanium series. Pretty neat. You know, it always made me wonder what's this guy on top really look like? He's not really big enough for me to get a good feel on, aside from just knowing, hey, it's a person. Now, the original Star Wars Stormtrooper, I knew what that looked like, because I had some of the toys as a kid. But when it came time for the Clone Wars to come out, I had no idea what a clone looked like. Of course, friends tried to describe them to me, even saying they're kind of like proto stormtroopers, so I had a general idea. But I was always curious. But not a whole lot I could do about it. Then I realized, you know, I'm an adult. So if I want to, I can do stupid childish things. So I did this. So having a bit of a stressful time a couple of weeks ago, I went on to Amazon and brought myself a clone trooper. Trone, clone trooper, there we go. Why not? I was curious what they really look like. I was also curious what a modern action figure was. Again, I grew up in the time of either 12 inch G.I. Joes and a few other things, or the three and three quarter G.I. Joes and Star Wars before that. It was also like the, what, five inch? He-Man? I was curious, and why not? So this is one of the Black series. It seemed a good balance between detail and uh, price. There are some actual nice ones out there, but, you know. And since this is me, I'm not really going to talk much about the figure. I'm going to talk more about the fake history, the in universe history of the clones, and their gear, like this blaster here. He is so going to fall over while I'm doing this. <laughs> As you know, the whole clone army was designed on the template of Jango Fett, i.e. Boba Fett. And frankly, while the movie Attack of the Clones was not a good movie, it was actually a really interesting concept. A, dispo a disposable droid army versus a disposable clone army. In fact, these weren't considered people. They were considered property. The thing is, it was kind of argued who owned them. Either the Communions or the New Republic Coruscant. See, he's wobbly. Wobbly. I think they make stands for these, but yeah. So no one really thought they were people. In the universe, the project began in 32 BBY, so before the Battle of Yavin, i.e. the original Star Wars, and they were accelerated growth so that they were ready by 22 BBY, conveniently for the Battle of Geonosis, which launched the Clone War. They had about a million under creation with more planned, under contract, and about 200,000 were ready to go for the battle. Of those, 192,000 were actually transported to Geonosis using a dozen acclimator proto-star destroyers. And they fought there and did their thing. And the idea is these are basically elite troops. They're meant to be... See, I told you. Fall. They're meant to be superior to a droid. In fact, a 20 to 1 ratio, kill ratio, was kind of known. That could even up sometimes. And they were pretty well custom trained. The accelerated aging was, of course, a double-edged sword. You could have a soldier ready in just under 10 years. But, of course, that meant he would only have a few years of active service. But that's okay, because they were cannon fodder. 
So this one here is a so-called phase one clone in phase one armor with the original uh, blaster. This is a DC-15A. So yeah, spinny thingy is not going to work for this. Oh well, it's a little actually uneven is part of the problem. So let's talk about the blaster rifle first. These were designed on Camino, although they were designed for the Django Fed body, the clone body. They were produced by uh, Bla Blaztec, Blaztec, who pretty much made all the blasters for the Republic, for the Army. Kind of funny how no one ever wondered why there was a bunch of uh, clones, armor, guns, ships ready to go. <laughs> and uh, it's big, but it's designed for a big specialist soldier that has very good accuracy. Overall length is about 1.3 meters, so 51 inches. And weight, depending on how it's outfitted, is uh, about 4.4 to 4.5 kilos, so over 9.5 to nearly 10 pounds. And uh, it's your typical Star Wars blaster. It's built for long range and power. It can have a range up to 10 kilometers, although it's better much close in. And uh, it can punch through concrete and armor. It uses Tabana gas and energy cartridges. Basically, it's a plasma gun. It has a gas cartridge in the stock here. It's a fixed stock. And um, that one cartridge is good for up to 500 standard rounds or 300 high-powered rounds. And it does need an energy pack that's loaded in from the side. And that's good for about 50 to 60 shots before replacing and basically gas from the one cartridge gets energized by energy from the other turning it into plasma and that's formed into a bolt using this long barrel that uses the wonder of magnets to get it out and do that this was select fire although it was not really designed for sustained fire it was better in single shot or sort round burst otherwise it would overheat they also say it had a recoil. I'm not really sure how a plasma gun has recoil, but okie dokie. And uh, what's kind of neat is the actual real-world CGI model used is somewhat loosely based on a German MG-34, hence the big size. But it does give it kind of that element, and it has a fixed stock. Some had wood stocks as well. These could be fitted with scopes or my bipods or tripods. So what about the armor? Again, this Phase 1 armor was made specifically for the FET clones. And it consisted of uh, kind of a thermal insulated, basically vacuum sealed body glove underneath. It was black. And then over that, you had 20 plasteel, plastoid plates of armor. It uh, featured an enclosed helmet with uh, targeting displays and other stuff inside. And it was, again, sealed. In fact, this could survive in a vacuum temporarily. It had enough emergency oxygen for about 20 minutes. Of course, you could attach an external air source. So it was nominally vacuum tight. It was also nominally watertight. It was proof against uh, concussion, grenades, fragments, uh, different types of discharges, but it could not take a direct blaster hit. And it had a utility belt, the standard. Typically, they carried grenades including thermal detonators, uh, rations, an emergency medical pack, sometimes a grappling hook or other gear, sometimes a utility kit that included uh, tools, and the most important thing, butt wipes, because MREs are the future. And it was not particularly light, about 20 kilograms for the whole 
get up, so about twice the weight of the rifle. And it was not particularly comfortable to get into and out of or to do things like sit down in. But it was quite well sealed and protected. And it was well made because Phase 1 armor was made during peacetime. And it was loosely inspired by Mandalorian armor, i.e. Boba Fett's armor. Back in the 80s, we, if you knew that Boba Fett's armor was called Mandalorian, that was kind of the height of uh, geekdom back then. Has this little backpack on the back, uh, plate anyway, and um, some like this type of armor because of uh, its high quality. It was quite tough. Kind of had a individually built feel to it, and some didn't because again it wasn't the most comfortable. And kind of the same thing goes with the gun. It was appreciated for its power, range. Relatively good accuracy, at least in single shot. But it was also, well, big and heavy and not good at rapid fire, so not good at close quarters. Thus, already within a year or so of the Clone Wars beginning, we would start to see improvements. Because, yeah, I didn't buy just one clone. The Phase 2 clone and the DC-15S blaster carbine. The phase one was of course an attack of the clones and appeared in other media but then with Revenge of the Sith we ended up with phase two here and in reality the biggest difference is the helmet. But in universe of course the armor is there's more to say, although it is basically the same, whereas this was more or less handcrafted during peacetime for the Phase 1. For Phase 2, it was mass-produced for wartime, and it was more expensive, but on the other hand, more modular. It was also a little bit lighter, more ergonomic, easier to get in and out of, easier to wear for long periods of time, and it was easier to customize and add different equipment for different specialties too. One of the few areas it really lost out, it lost its uh, life support system. While it did have air, air filtration, it actually wasn't sealed up enough and did not have its own air supply like the Phase 1. So if you needed that, an external life support system would have to be attached, typically a helmet and then a pack. Think of uh, like a TIE pilot. It was uh, about the same durability, but its main thing was the adaptability, although the boots were improved for better gripping and uh, a few other things like that. They carried essentially the same equipment, although more and more specialties were appearing. This uh, Phase 2 first appeared in 20. One BBY, about halfway through the year for the Battle of Camino. Excuse me, the Battle of Mon Cal. <laughs> and uh, it took a while to really phase out the Phase One. But by the Battle of Coruscant, which is the is Revenge of the Sith beginning, it was mostly replacing the Phase One. Although a few soldiers hung on to it. And this is definitely the immediate predecessor of the Stormtrooper armor. In fact, it would continue in production and service into the early Imperial Age, really not being replaced by the Stormtrooper armor until three or four years after. And even then, it would take about a decade before the remaining suits were put up in storage. It was more expensive, though, which is one of the reasons it was eventually phased out when peacetime hit. So what about its little blaster? Whereas the DC-15A rifle was based on the MG-34 in real life, the DC-15S carbine is loosely based on the Sterling submachine gun. I say that because in the real world, this is based on the Stormtrooper E-11 blaster, which itself was a modified Sterling prop. So by the time they did this, they kind of used that as inspiration. In the uh, universe, 
It's meant to be lighter and more compact. It has an underfolding stock. It's uh, quite a bit smaller, still good size though. It's better at rapid fire than the 15A. In fact, a light trigger pull is single shot. If you pull all the way back, it is uh, full auto. About the same in capacity, even though it's smaller, 500 rounds for the gas and 50 to up to 100 rounds for the energy cell, depending on the power setting. And still quite accurate and long ranged for its smaller size. In fact, it's small enough that it could be used as a large pistol or even dual wielded. But while the 15A was still in service throughout the Clone War, towards the last year or two, more, more and more 15Ss would uh, show up and along with the new lighter armor, just kind of lightened up the kit for the clones overall. Now I should say that while the Kaminoans, Kaminoans I guess, were very good cloners, they did have a failure rate of about 3.5%. Now some of these could be, uh, could be saved. Gene therapy, all that. Others were just kind of terminated. Again, they weren't really treated as people. But uh, when you're growing them, I guess it's hard to say. <laughs> and there would be specialties, but that's a topic for another video. While we're here, though, one other little weapon is the DC-17 blaster pistol. Because, well, you still need a pistol. This is mostly meant for officers, commandos, as a second line personal defense gun, but sometimes special forces would use two of these, dual wielding them, because, well, Hollywood is a primary gun. It's classed as a heavy blaster pistol, and actually has good energy storage, at least 50 shots, good range, lightweight, and uh, the real world inspiration basis for this is actually loosely the Colt 1911. Loosely. But yeah, this is considered the clone pistol. There's also a DC-15 pistol, but that was a different critter. And so those are the three main clone guns, along again with their thermal detonators and other gear. And these are the main clone armor. I should point out that early on, the colors, the stripes, designated rank. Uh, sergeants were green. Lieutenants were blue. Captains, red. And commanders, the highest rank there, were yellow. But by the time of phase two, colors stopped denoting rank and started denoting which division. For example, this is from the five, 501st, the 501 Vader's division. Because yeah, these would carry on into the Imperial era, at least for a few years. The last FET clones would come away from Camino shortly after the end of the Clone Wars. And uh, really, by the time when the wars were over, nearly half of the original batch were gone anyway, dead or injured. Of course, newer ones were made throughout the war. And so they would continue to serve, making up the first of the Stormtrooper Corps. But by 15 BBY, 14 BBY, they were just getting old. At that point, they were well over 30 years old, some, most of them in their time, which for a soldier is uh, can be getting up there, especially after going through combat. So by 10 BBY, most of them were aged out. The ones that stayed were instructors and support, but at that point, clones and their equipment, that was all too expensive. So they went to recruiting for the Stormtrooper Corps and the Stormtrooper Armor and the E-11 
it was all more for peace time and we can talk stormtroopers if you want one day I'm just experimenting with this video speaking of what do I think of these toys or figures or whatever you'd like to call them again my experience is uh, nearly 40 years out of date the Star Wars toys I grew up with were pretty hard plastic smaller and they were you know five points you could move the the arms were pretty well straight and you could move them up and all that you also had head movement back in the day now this is the older figure of the two so it has a little bit more limited articulation but it's still compared to what i grew up with great you've got the elbow you've got rotations here the little hand moves which is kind of neat there's waist, I don't know. The legs have always been a sticking point for any figure because it's hard to do them and look right, I know that. I remember some of the, was it, Playmates Star Trek figures in the 90s. The one I always thought, I thought was funny was the newer figures amongst many brands that they have moving feet. There's different types of movement and rotation, but the fact to have moving feet is funny to me. Another thing, again, the hand, but this does have a hand that, yeah, it rotates, but it also has a swivel up and down a little bit, just to kind of pose it. And that seems to be what these are geared towards, is uh, more posing and less literal play. Because the ones I grew up with were meant for little kids. I'm sure little kids could still do these, but I don't know, it seems like they're little too jointy of course here's the somewhat newer one with even more going on as far as most of the movement especially for the head hello bloop bloop of course each figure is a little different because of uh what what they're wearing, what they're doing. So yeah, the movement and the posability is a lot more. I always crap me up too that you've got you got little trigger fingers now on these guys. So like this one has a movement here in the little hand. And the hands are more of a rubbery material versus the hard-ass plastic G.I. Joe's and even Star Wars to a lesser extent were made out of. Now the weapons, well, the very traditional Star Wars. The old school Star Wars figures never came with a ton of accessories, sometimes just one or two at most. And these kind of continue on the grand tradition. This guy came with this large blaster here and uh, the smaller one. This guy only came with the blaster in his hand. And the one that this guy came with actually only had two pistols. This kind of depends. Some have more than others. At least they don't come in those trees. I know that some of the later G.I. Joes, they had that tree thing going on. It was pretty ick. And they're, they're formed kind of plasticky. Some are more rigid than others. Some are painted, some aren't. I just wanted to satisfy my curiosity. It's interesting. Why not? Again, they're not three dollars like they were when I was a kid. But then again, you can't buy with three dollars what you could back then either. I could definitely see people having fun posing these and making little scenes and dioramas, what have you. And for me personally, now I at least know what a clone trooper looks like. But I hear tell that there are different things like arc troopers and commandos and pilots and now that's kind of tempting to me. <laughs> We'll see.
Anyway, guys, appreciate you hanging out. And, uh, I don't know. Again, just doing something different. Why not? This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.